I'm Dr. Crystal Brimer, and I'm in private practice in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I've been for 22 years. I have had the honor and distinct pleasure of being part of a lot of wonderful dry eye projects over the last decade. The one that's closest to my heart is Dry Eye Institute. Um, I'm just, I'm driven and I'm passionate about inspiring doctors and motivating them and, and equipping them, not just with a clinical protocol, but with the logistical tools to truly implement change. And to be honest with you, I, I, my calling is not for the masses, but it's to make a, a life-changing difference in a smaller number of doctors and truly impact their fulfillment, their, their personal and their professional fulfillment. And I try to do the same thing for myself along the way. Um, and to that note, I took out the optical and got rid of all routine insurances and, and routine care about two and a half years ago. And so for the next hour, I want to share with you some of my clinical pearls on dry eye and some of the, the cheat sheets that I've created. Um, there's just not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it takes me two days at Dry Eye Institute, but I want to I want to give you the highlights and just some of the things that I've learned along the way, including some rules to live by. So it starts right here. Screen everyone, schedule them back for a dry eye eval, plan, create a plan, write it down, and then when they get there, look at them. Take the time to look and to listen and see who's in the chair and how you need to relate with them and then spend some time showing them your findings and telling them their story and deciding together what the treatment's gonna be. A lot of it starts here, it's screening every patient every year. And I am uh, pretty hardcore about this because it is one rule that's very tangible. You know if it's working or not, you know if you're doing it. And it really creates accountability, not just with the doctor to respond to the symptoms and respond to the, the um, screening protocol, but it creates accountability among the staff as well. And it should. This needs to be a hard, fast rule that is not um, gotten out of easily. And in order to make that happen, we really have to look at the flow of the office and how the patient um, goes through that, that workup protocol and, and really create something that uh, is intertwined easily. Um, so for instance, if we're gonna use a piece of equipment and there's gonna be a printout, we need that printer right there in the room. Um, and it needs to be uh, in the room with the workup equipment, not somewhere else in the, in the office where the technician has to walk back and forth. So little things like that to make it easier and to have less resistance. In our office, we started out with a simple laminated piece of paper that said, would you answer yes to any of the following questions? And I did this because I just didn't want the hassle of a survey, to be quite frank. And then she would turn the page and she'd say, uh, oh, and you've got diabetes and thyroid disease. And then she'd turn the next page and she'd say, oh, and you're on antidepressant and anti, uh, antihistamines. Uh, there's, you know, there's a good chance that you might have dry eye. Well, we have come a long way, baby. <laughs> so we started out doing that, and now we use the Oculus 5M with the, cri the, crystal uh, <laughs> the crystal tear screening. The tests that I choose to use are the tear meniscus height, the non-invasive keratograph breakup time, and the redness score. Now, the reason I choose these is because it gives me a glimpse of water, oil, and inflammation. It takes two minutes from the time the patient puts their chin in the chin rest until the paper is printing out of the printer. Now, if you don't have two minutes, uh, you could exchange that breakup time for interferometry, where you see the, the rainbow prism when there's oil present. And this is still gonna give you that snapshot of water, oil, and inflammation, but in one minute instead of two minutes. And then the patient is still gonna get that wonderful report and so I want you to imagine this, okay? The, your, the patient is sitting in the exam room. Those three pictures are on the screen in front of them and they're reading the report. And the report is telling them, you may have symptoms, you may not, but here's your findings. And it's explaining you know, the, the purpose of the test and, and um, how their scores uh, add up. 
And then you walk into the exam room and the patient's going, Hey doc, what's this? And you're saying, well, let me take a look. And you've got that beautiful scenario where the patient is asking you for it. I want you to think about how this would influence the patient's buy-in. Now let's take it a step further. Let's compare this to a speed questionnaire or an OSDI. And the patient fills out the survey, they've got some symptoms and you say, oh yeah, no doubt. I'm gonna need you to do some warm compresses and some lid scrubs and we need to get a lipoflow scheduled immediately. And I, I need you to buy a, like 12 different masks at, the, at minimum. <laughs> and the patient says, yeah, you know what? It's really not that bad. I feel, I'm feeling better already. <laughs> <laughs> or let's say the patient does it and, and they buy the stuff and they go home and they do it and then they, they start feeling better. What happens? They're going to stop because in that scenario, they think that the recommendation was based on their symptoms and not the findings. And with the way that I do it now, that's not the case. My recommendations are based on findings and that's how I always want it to be in my exam room. So think about this and think about what your screening is going to be and screen everyone. Next up, rule number two, schedule them back. Please do not try to squeeze dry eye into that routine exam. Think about the patient. Think about what they had to go through. They had to get time off work and then they're thinking about their vision insurance and what their, what's their VSB copay going to be. <laughs> <laughs> this year and they're thinking about picking out glasses and they have to be dilated and they got to get back to work all these things and then you're just going to squeeze dry eye right in there well what's going to happen either the patient feels better with the recommendations you made and so they don't return for any further evaluation or you made your recommendations and they don't feel better and now they don't return because they figured you had your shot and it didn't work and either way, this is going to create poor buy-in to the process, uh, to the treatment plan, and to the ongoing compliance. Now, on the flip side of that, let's imagine that you did their routine exam, but you said, listen, we need to get to the bottom of this. We need to do it right. I don't have the time to do the testing it takes to really uncover what's causing your symptoms and what's causing you to look this way. So I'm going to bring you back right off the bat what you've done is you made it seem important to you. And the thing is, it's never gonna seem important to the patient if it's not first important to you. So you bring them back for a real dry eye eval and you, you walk through the findings, you walk through the options on the treatment, you get their buy-in and their trust. This is gonna lead to compliance, which is gonna lead to relief. And now great outcomes, referrals, growth, revenue. But it all starts right here. So screen everyone, schedule them back for dry eye eval. And number three, have a plan. <laughs> Don't wing this, please. Uh, the, the things in blue are the things that are gonna happen before the patient ever gets to you. So it's gonna be scheduled and then they're gonna fill out everything you wanna know. One of the complaints about dry eye from doctors is that it takes too long. Well, one reason it takes too long is we need a really good history. And if you don't have an amazing questionnaire to send out before the exam, then you're going to waste time in the exam room, whether it's your time or your text time, trying to get the answers out of them. This is not what you want. It's not how you want to spend the, the conversation. So on my questionnaire, I ask everything. I ask about depression and stress and anxiety and sleep and water intake and fish intake. Um, because I want to know those things, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so get that beforehand. The parts in red are what your dry eye person is going to be. It's probably a better name than person, but you need this person. <laughs> you need this one who has been ordained by you to, to really uh, be the, the, the one that carries the torch for this and puts legs to your dream. And so you want this one same person to work up every dry eye eval, please. Um, and she's going to do the workup. You're going to walk in. And this part is very, very important. Maybe the most important thing. You're going to set the stage for the patient. You're going to tell them that you are going to look at all the categories of what's causing their issues. And you are going to explain it to them. And then you guys are going to decide together what treatment is best for them and that it will all be written down. So let me say that again. 
you're going to find out what's wrong. You are going to explain it to them. <laughs> you're going to decide together what treatments are best for them. And it's all going to be written down. And what this does, it just puts their mind at ease. You're not trying to sell them anything. They don't have to remember a thousand things. And that's a big important part of them being present in the moment when you are doing your explanation. And then you're going to hand it back to your dry eye person <laughs> and she's going to do the coaching and explain <clears throat> how to do the, the, um, the, the chores at home. So when I say have a plan, it's not just about the plan for that exam. It's about the plan for the office. So yes, as far as a clinical protocol, how do you know if it's aqueous deficiency? What test are you gonna do? What's your treatment for mild, moderate, severe? What about MGD? What about inflammation? What about allergies and bacteria and lid function? And what screening are you gonna use? Well, who's gonna do it? Well, what's the conversion criteria to bring them back for dry eye eval? What's the dialogue for that? Um, who, how are we gonna take this key person and have her grow and develop and then uh, basically spread, spread this like wildfire throughout the office? What instrumentation do you have now? What's your ROI on it? What's your goals uh, six months from now, 12 months from now? And what's the business model behind there? A dream without a plan is simply a wish. There is a big difference between a dream and a wish. Um, and I want this to be real for you, but it really starts with writing it down. And then rule number four, look at your patient. You know, I think back to school and I feel like we rushed through the, the whole anterior segment to get to the posterior segment, to look at that retina and look at that nerve because we were scared to death of, you know, long-term damage that was irreversible. And now maybe we've got more attention to the anterior segment. So kudos to us for that. But I still don't think we're putting enough attention on looking at that patient from across the room and really understanding what other conditions do they have, what other mindsets do they have that could be um, influential in our outcome. And so when you look here, you see one has rheumatoid arthritis. Several of them have rosacea. I've got one here that's at a computer for 12 hours a day. Another one that owns a, a landscaping business and is outside in the sun all day. These are important factors. I want my patient to know uh, that I know where they're coming from and I want to relate to them. And so this is a four by eight foot sign when they walk in my door. And it basically says, um, why me? How do you know? And what can we do about it? And it really starts with this, why me? And with us taking the time to look at the patient, yeah, of course, we're going to look at the, the ocular surface disease and hopefully the systemic disease and contributions. But it's more than that. It's more, it's looking at like I said, their mental disposition on this and their perspective. What bad experiences have they had in the past that's influencing them? What's their emotional status, their physical well being, and the environment that they're in? And so, next, I want you to listen to this patient. Listen not just to, in order to connect better, but listen so that it changes how we present to them. It changes our words and our tone and our story that we're creating for them. Why? Because ultimately we want the very best outcome. And the reality is if we take the same approach to every patient, we're not going to get the buy-in. And so we're not going to have that very best outcome. One of the challenges with OSD treatment is this delayed gratification. They're doing the work, they're doing the work, they're doing the work, and they're getting nothing. And it takes time, as we know, for them to feel improvements. And sometimes we'll see improvements before they actually feel it. So how do we combat that in our office? Every dry eye eval gets one of these pages. Um, it is 11 weeks worth of check boxes. And we narrow down their to-do list to morning, afternoon, and bedtime. And then I ask them, I say, please check this off. I know you're not in fifth grade, but it really does help mentally for you to know where you are in this uh, in this chain of events, you know, where you are in your journey. Uh, rule number five, show. I want to pull this together. We want to have a plan of if this, then that, but it is very important that we have something to show the patient. Um, I strongly recommend if you want to do dry eye in your practice, have a camera, an anterior segment camera, at least um, a keratograph version at, at best. 
my slit lamp exams are always the same. It does not matter why they are there. My technician, if I had a scribe, she would hear me say the same thing, look down. I'm gonna evaluate that upper row of lashes and then I'm gonna have them look straight and I'm gonna look at the lower lid margin. I'm gonna go next into the tear film and then conjunctiva, cornea, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm going to look at the meibomian glands and squeeze for functionality. This is important because each one of those structures tells me something. It tells me a diagnosis. And then I put those diagnoses together and say, okay, patient, here's our number one problem. Here's our, our secondary problems. Here's what we can do about it. So I wanna walk through each one of these structures and each one of these stops on the slit lamp exam. And we can talk through findings, but I really wanna talk about it um, in terms of diagnosis. And so looking here, I've got migrating makeup. Um, I've got demodex. I've got this good old blepharitis. I've got a strong line of marks, which is telling me about my Bohmian gland deficiency. But usually this is also the person where when I debride, I've got a lot of biofilm there as well. I've got trichiasis. I've got capped my Bohmian glands. I've got a poor lid closure, partial blanks. Here I've got rosacea and pouting oil glands, some MGD. And here I've got lower lid lag. Um, as well as MGD and potentially rosacea with the scalloped thickened lid margin. And here I've got um, rosacea as well, thickened lid margin, inflammation. And then next onto tear film quality. Upper left, we've got epiphora. You can see that patient starting to over tear. We've got poor um, tear film spreading. So this might be the patient that has lid wiper epitheliopathy as well. Um, or it could have been quick tear film breakup. Here again, tear film breakup. And on the bottom one, we've got allergic mucus, which usually will be long and stringy like this, as opposed to just chronic tear film debris like these upper pictures. Um, now, when I have staining right here at the puncta, most of the time it's gonna be a dirty contaminated tear film. When we're talking in, in way of diagnosis though, what does that mean? Well, it depends. If it's stringy, it's usually more allergic. If it's froth like this, then we've got an MGD problem. Um, if it's just good old debris, it could still be an MGD problem because the oil's thin enough to get out, but it's, it's thick and contaminated in general or it could be inflammatory proteins. It could be the fact that we don't have enough fluid to dilute these particles in the tear film. And then of course it could be scurf and biofilm along the lid margin or demodex releasing exotoxins into the tear film. To further our tear film analysis, we can do osmolarity and find out if it's hyperosmolar. And we can also do inflammadry to find out if the MMP9 markers are elevated in this patient. and the conjunctiva. Uh, I've got superior limbal keratitis here. I've got a nice bleb here. I've got ex excessive conjunctiva here. So conjunctival chalasis. Don't miss this. This is gonna be the patient that complains of foreign body sensation. They have chronic redness and they have tears overflowing. And then hyperemia. Um, here I've got some lysamine green staining. Uh, this one's around a pinguecula. And then here we've got good old papillae. I always take this picture because I want to document what it is today in case down the road they come up and they're, they're really large and I'm not sure how big they were to begin with. So it's one of the pictures in my original assessment. And then of course, if they've got papillae on top, they are likely to have a pretty significant allergic issue. and the corneal assessment. I spend some time here. I wanna know, are there any uh, corneal scars, opacifications, uh, any history of surgeries, any dystrophies like the EBMD here? And if they have staining, I wanna know about the pattern. Is it centralized where it's um, band staining or it's from exposure from partial blinks? Is it a recurrent corneal erosion? 
or is it inferior staining where I've got um, typically just a really contaminated tear film? I do corneal sensitivity testing on that first dry eye eval. This is really important to me. I wanna know if there's neurotrophic keratitis or not because that's gonna influence my treatment plan. And keep in mind that patients with NK are likely not to be complaining of pain because their sensation is down. And then moving on to the meibomian gland evaluation. Um, I wanna know the structure and so in my office, I use the Oculus 5M and I love this because I no longer have that laminated piece of paper that I was talking to death. I can say, all right, here's ideal, here's yours. And I drag it along that um, comparison grid. And I don't have to say hardly anything. Um, I do like to explain, all right, this is a one-way street. The, the oil can only go out. And if it's not going out, it can't go back in. And so these glands are gonna die over time. But when I slide that, that picture down, these patients are typically going, what can we do? Can we get them back? Now, let's say you don't have that. That's okay. At least, do you have a transilluminator? I bet you do. So at least do transillumination. Um, start this on Monday, turn the slit lamp off, take the transilluminator, put it up under that bottom lid and fold the lid over. And you can see in this one, there's short squatty glands. Uh, my Bowman gland evaluator here from J&J, &J, this is supposed to simulate the pressure of a blink. And so you push it in halfway and I mainly use this as a patient education tool. Oh, I'd like to see 10, I've got one. And then I pull my forceps out. So here we've got normal down here and this is clearly um, semi-solid mybum coming out. This is not what we wanna see. I'm doing this diagnostically, not therapeutically but I do it on every single exam. So not only do I express the glands diagnostically, but I also debride on every single exam. And I do this because it gives me a wealth of information. How am I gonna know if their nutraceutical is good enough or if I need to add something else to it um, if I don't squeeze those glands? How am I gonna know if my hygiene regimen is good enough if I don't debride the lid? Why does it matter? It matters because your patients want to know why. This is one of the most important things you can do for compliance. And if you've ever heard me talk, you've heard me harp about um, the fact that patient education is the key to compliance and compliance creates the outcomes. The outcomes are what gets you the referrals, the growth, the revenue. So it starts right here. Patients wanna know why, and if you include them in this, they'll be bought into your treatment plan. So imagine this scenario. I am, I've told them, I'm gonna find out what's the root cause of, of your problem. Is it water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, something systemic, something environmental. We're gonna test in every category. Whatever's positive, we'll pair it with the treatment that works for that category. I said that when I walked in the exam room. Now here we are going through it. Okay, look at this. Our water's a little bit low and look at this lid margin. You see how that gland is puckered up like a pimple. That oil is not getting out. And I know that because there's no color here on this picture, on this video. There should be color here like a rainbow uh, as if it, it rained on a greasy spot outside. And I also know because your tears are breaking up too quickly. It's because we don't have enough oil in there to delay that evaporation time. And my real concern is that over time, if these glands continue to stay clogged up, you will lose them and we can't get them back. Now, uh, another concern here is the debris in the tear film. It becomes toxic to that ocular surface and you can see how red and inflamed you are, not just here on the white part, but look at the lid margin and the, the rosacea impact here as far as the thickening of the lid margin. So think about that story. And think about how this impacts the patient's buy-in. They have their because, and they didn't have to trust me blindly. They could see for themselves that what I was telling them made sense, that it, it correlated to, um, to a good enough reason to do whatever it was I was about to recommend for them. So think about that. Think about how you tell the story to the patient now how you deliver you know, your request to them, your treatment plan, and what's their current buy-in? And how much different could it be if you changed your methods and changed what you showed them? 
And then every patient, every dry eye eval leaves with this crystal tear report. Um, in our office, this is pretty important to us. Um, it's one of the reasons why we are able to bill our dry eye eval because of this, this value add. But basically, it's going to uh, grade their each category, and it'll be the stoplight approach with red being severe. And then it's going to go and show them uh, where their biggest issues were, what tests we did for each one of those categories that colored it red or orange or green, and then what treatments were specific to that uh, to that problem. And at the end, it tells you the definition of all the tests and it tells you uh, the summary of all the treatments that we're asking them to do. And lastly, so we've, let's see, we screened, we scheduled, we planned, we listened, we showed, and now we're gonna tell. And this is really important. The, the patient wants to know, what in the world are we gonna do now? What are my options? There's so much out there, just help me. But they want to be a part of this. They, they don't want to be sold, they want to be told. And there's a really big difference. And I, I am so fulfilled in the way that I explain this to patients because I'm able to take them through that story I'm in the messenger. I never feel like I'm selling the patient. I tell them from the beginning, everybody's goals are different. You might want this fast. You might want it easy, not have to do a lot at home. You might want it more natural, or you might want it cheap. I can do any of those, but I can't do them all. And so I tell them that up front in that first two minute intro. And I do that so that I can learn about them and feed off of their cues throughout the exam. And then by the time I get to this part where I'm recommending treatments, I, um, I've already kind of sized up which track they wanna be on and I'm able to relate to them more specifically. So this is the part where in your head or on your exam form or in your EMR, you need a protocol of if this, then that. So these are the categories that I use um, what I want to say to you is that if this seems overwhelming or too big of a point to start with, don't worry about it. Just start with oil and inflammation. The majority, I mean, I don't even remember the last time I did a patient spiel and I didn't say, all right, our number one problem is oil and inflammation. It almost always is the number one problem. Now it might be one bigger than the other, but they're always the headliners. And so no what it takes to diagnose the oil and inflammation. We've already talked about that. And then know what your go-to treatments are gonna be at home and in the office for each category. So for me, when it comes to at-home treatments, I, um, I don't use a beaded mask very often. I think it's great for your routine patient, you know, for your patient who doesn't have moderate to severe MGD but your contact lens patient or just your annual exam, send it home with everybody, it's great. I typically use uh, the tranquilized version and I do that because it meets the research criteria of the 15 minutes, moist heat, and it is 104 to 110 degrees. Um, now you might say, oh, patients aren't gonna do that for 20 minutes. Well, if you told them your story and you told them the because and the research behind it, you might be surprised. Um, but that's my at-home heat. Now, I do have patients who won't do it for 20 minutes. Of course I do. And so in those patients, I'm more likely to push them towards the at-home exfoliation. Um, right now, New Lids is, I, I think, the only one on the market for this. And I love using it as a massaging device to help stimulate those oil glands. Now, if the patient wants amazing, killer, best it can be results from at-home treatments alone, then I want to do that 20 minute mask and I want to follow it with um, the blepharal exfoliation so that it can massage those glands and push that oil. I get incredible results with that. Now, I'm always going to start with a nutraceutical. I typically will start with the omega-3 either because my patient has a lot of systemic issues that I think it would help with um, or because I know their diet is not adequate. I, I like the, the three to one ratio of EPA to DHA uh, as far as its ability to thin out oil in, in the meibomian glands. I, I know there's great value to DHA and, and it may do other 
things and be a shining star in different ratios for different purposes, but that seems to work the best for me. If a patient comes back though, and remember what I said, I'm going to express them on every single visit. If they come back and it's still semi-solid coming out really thick, I'm going to add something to it. Uh, I'm going to usually add omega-6 so that I can have two different mechanisms of action. And if that doesn't do the trick over time, that's when I'm going to add in my doxycycline. But I would always rather do a supplement that's going to give me positive side effects than an antibiotic that might give me negative side effects. So this is my at-home uh, arsenal. And then when it comes to in office, um, IPL is, is my, I don't even know what you call it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's the foundation of, of my MGD treatment and inflammatory treatment in my office. Now, there's a lot of evacuation procedures that are out there now. Let's walk through some of the differences here um, and we'll come back to the IPL. Lipoflow is going to be the one that heats underneath and has compression on top. So it's the only one that truly heats underneath. This is important because it's not having to transverse the thick eyelid. It's only having to go through that skinny mucous membrane. And then there's constant expression for 12 whole minutes. Ilux in the top right hand corner of your screen is going to be a uh, pressure that's applied with uh, your thumb pushing the button. The magnifying glass shows you what's coming out and the heat is provided through a light. Uh, there is a safety protocol there or a safety measure which will keep you from pushing too hard on the device. And then the bottom left is tear care. Uh, this is going to be heat applied externally. The nice thing is the patient can keep their eyes open for it. It's 15 minutes. And as soon as you take those stickers off, you're going to express the glands manually at the slit lamp. Uh, low level light treatment. Uh, this is done with a mask and red is the, the color of choice for MGD. Basically it's absorbed in, uh, by the mitochondria to stimulate ATP production and energy in that cell. And then finally on the lower right, this is um, MibaFlow. So it's just gonna mechanically heat the lid margin. Uh, you do have to hold it, it's several sessions. Uh, it, and I did mention that LLLT is often several sessions as well, um, but there are no applicator costs on that MibaFlow. Now back to IPL, where does it lie in this whole big picture here? If I have a patient who has inflammation and they have MGD, uh, and they have stagnant oil coming out. I am gonna do IPL first because I need to get the inflammation under control. I don't want to evacuate the glands and then have them fill up with this thick mybum because that's still what they're making. I wanna thin out the mybum, get the inflammation under control. And the reality is if I do it first, then the MGD may take care of itself to some degree. You know, if I'm doing IPL series and I've got them on a nutraceutical, a lot of times they'll thin out and not need an evacuation procedure. So that is my goal. And uh, as far as inflammation and what's my at-home arsenal here, uh, still going to be nutraceuticals and doxycycline when needed. A lot of times on my dry eye eval, I'll send them home with a steroid ointment. And I do this because of dosing. Then I can get by with just one dose as opposed to something that's going to be four times a day. And this patient likely needed nighttime coverage anyway. Um, now, if the patient's under my care and they have a flare, that's a different story. I'm going to use a different, you know, steroid that's, that's made for flares. Uh, the New lids, the, the at-home blepharo exfoliation is also nice in just increasing the circulation along the lid margin. We don't do that. <laughs> and autologous blood serum. I'm a big fan of blood serum. I, I order it through Vital Tears and you can get that anywhere in the country. It comes now in concentrations of 20, 30, 40, 50, 75, and 100%. Um, this is going to be my patient that may already be on pharmaceuticals, most likely, and they're still either having complaints or they um, still have corneal staining. And so this is going to be my next step often. And then in office, in regards to inflammation, we already discussed, IPL is going to be my go-to for in-office treatment of inflammation. My buy-in is enormous. It, my conversion rate is well over 90%, probably 92 to 95 percent 
It helps that they can pay as they go. It helps that they get the cosmetic benefit from it. But I think the biggest thing on my conversion is just because I'm such a believer in it and the patient hears that in my tone, they see it in the stories on, on the reviews um, and they, they hear it from my technicians. It's just pretty evident within the office. This patient who has inflammation and they have gone through my IPL series, if they still have any staining, even if it's not significant, if it's chronic persistent staining, um, or if my corneal sensation or sensitivity test shows me that they're neurotrophic, I'm gonna do amniotic membrane. I'm gonna do cryopreserved amniotic membrane um, because I feel more comfortable with the safety profile and with my own experience in the past. I am 100% confident that I'm not going to have an adverse event with this cryopreserved amniotic membrane. Now, if I've done Procara or amniotic membrane and I still have chronic staining or they still have complaints, this is where we've got to step it up to the next level. And I'm going to talk to them about all three of these options. I love fitting scleral lenses for my dry eye patients. I had a patient who went from grade four staining to zero within a month after fitting her scleral lenses. I love the incredible vision that it gives them. Um, I love that with my Pentacam wave, I can, I can get 50 scans with you know one click and then create a customized lens for them. I probably am, am not good enough to do it another way, uh, but with that, I get an incredible first-time fits. Now, if that's not a good option for the patient, dexterity-wise, they can't do it, or there's a, a number of other reasons why it may not be a good option, Oxrate is, is probably going to be my go-to because it's only eight weeks long, it's six times a day, and the studies showed that the folks who got this corneal resolution, that it remained 80% of the time, it remained a year later. I said that funny, but you got my point. Um, and then lastly, Acthar injections. This is a, a systemic injection, uh, so it's going to have a systemic effect. I'm going to use that more so on a patient who has some serious systemic issues, but they've already been to the rheumatologist and you know, they're not finding a diagnosis and we don't have any contraindications. And the main contraindication is if they have a contraindication to steroids, then you would not want to use this, even though only about 5% of it is actually steroid-based. And moving on quickly to bacteria and lid function, uh, you know what it looks like. And so now figure out what's your at-home and in-office treatment. I told you that most of the time, inflammation and MGD are my number one problem. Most of the time, bacteria or lid function are either or um, are going to be my secondary issue. So at home, I'm going to use um, you know very strong tea tree component whenever there is Demodex. And if it's just a pretty routine, um, like, like your contact lens patient that you're just trying to be proactive, then just a good 1% tea tree soap would be fine. I like to use these tub, uh, tub cleansers. It's, they, they like, they're like the old Stridex cleansers where they have the pads. I like those pre-soaked pads for my patients who have dexterity issues or might be in a rest home setting, something like that, and we need to help them with compliance. And then I'm going to use my hypochlorous acid whenever um, I've got biofilm on the lid margin. Why? Because the soap is not going to get there. I need something that they can apply either with a Q-tip or with their blepharo exfoliation at home in order to completely eliminate that. Because what happens is once that lid, lid margin is clean, my tear film is beautiful and clean. And then the redness is going to take care of itself. I know a lot of you have a ton of patients who are red and it's one of the most stubborn things to um, overcome and fix. As far as at home, this, this is still on the right. The new lids is the at home blepher exfoliation. And then you've got Blefex as the in office exfoliation. Um, I see an enormous, I, I can't even begin to quantify the difference I see in the results of patients who are doing this every single day at home versus doing it occasionally in the office. 
Um, if you don't have either, then you can buy these Q-tips that are preloaded with some pretty strong chemicals uh, to apply in the office and get them a head start. But I highly recommend looking into the at-home blepharoexfoliation because it's gonna clean the lid and not just the lashes if they have demodex, it's gonna clean that lid margin where the scurf is, but it's also gonna massage the glands and help um, increase the circulation around there too. Now, lid dysfunction. Uh, I am a huge fan of the overnight sleep mask. This is a silicone mask and it basically eliminates evaporation. And because of that, the heat from your body is gonna create steam and you're gonna have condensation. So this mask is gonna be wet. It is not like an airplane mask, very, very different. And I tell people that. And then you've got this moisture chamber goggle where you can run these little chambers under the water so that they actually have a little hydration chamber. The bottom is an example of conjunctival chalasis repair. Um, of course, we're not gonna do this, but we can refer out for it. And you see that it will, fixing this, uh, restores that reservoir where the tears can stay. And then the top right was just an example of rehabilitation with blink exercises. I know it's hard for patients um, to win at this, but you gotta tell them about it. You gotta remind them and, and tell them to do it in correlation with something they do already that's very repetitive. So if they're reading, do it at the top of every page. The other culprits, I'm leaving this up to you guys. You know, figure out how do I know, yes or no, and then what am I gonna treat it with? These are my good, better, best. Um, it doesn't have to be yours, <laughs> but these are my go-tos and I've, I've found them to be incredibly useful. Um, there are other great treatments out there and it really is about what you feel comfortable with, what you already have, and what you're ready to expand to and, and when you're ready to do that. Now, I use this as my explanation to the patient. So I've told the patient, here's your number one problem, uh, inflammation and MGD or oil, oil problem. Number two is this and this. Now, let's look at what we're gonna do. Oil, here's our good, better, best option. Inflammation, here's our good, better, best. And then we decide together, I told you that. Well, you might not feel comfortable explaining it that way and you don't have to. Here's another way that's more of a summary scenario for the patient. You can say, all right, my, our primary problem is this and this, our secondary is this and this. We can address this different ways. We can work on your lifestyle issues, work on your diet and hydration and better sleep, mitigating your stress. We can do some supportive things at home with some eye wash and uh, some special cleansers and a mask to, to heat up. We can do some prescriptions. Uh, there's some, some long-term prescriptions that help control the inflammation. There's also some short-term ones that we can kind of put the fire out with. And then there's also in-office procedures that help truly get us the results quicker and, and in a, a bigger, more yeah. dynamic way. Now, likely the, the best scenario is to use all of these categories. So here's my recommendation for you. I'm gonna tell you and you let me know what you think and then list out what you've chosen for that patient. It's another great way of explaining it to them but helping them know that we do have options. Next, follow up and follow through. So when they come back, you're looking at those categories and saying, all right, here's the ones we're winning at. We can back off. Here's what we're not winning at. We've gotta go up a level of aggression. Now, as far as the logistics on just when do you have them back, majority of my patients, they're, they're scheduling a procedure. So they're on this green track, but let's say they weren't. Let's say they're on the yellow track. The patient does not want a procedure. Well, in that case, I'm not bringing them back for two months because I need whatever it is I've given them at home to have a chance to kick in. Now, the reality is they're not going to be better in two months. We're going to have to tweak something, bring them back six weeks later, probably tweak something. They're, look, they're better now, though. They're just not all the way better. So we can start extending that follow-up to three months and then four to six months. Um, the majority of my patients are on the green track. So the first appointment is as soon as we can get them in. Uh, we work our cancellation list. You know, we're booked out two to three months, but we put them on that cancellation list, get them in fast for that IPL number one. We do number two. Most of the time, I go ahead and do three and four, but if they have severely clogged glands, I'm going to go ahead and do my evacuation treatment 
um, in between my IPL series. But a lot of times if it's going pretty well and that oil is thinning out, then I'm gonna wait until we're finished with our IPL. We do all four of them. If they're doing great, see you in six months. And from now on, that patient is on a biannual uh, or semi-annual um, return course. If they're not 100%, you know, if I'm not 100% sure and they're not 100% sure, I'll have them back in three months. If they're still symptomatic, I'll have them back in one month because I'm going to do something else to them. But I want my IPLs to have fully kicked in. Uh, there is an exception to this rule. It's when they need prep. So let's say they have heinous demodex or blepharitis, and I just need to get it cleaned up before we do anything else, then I'm going to give them some heavy treatments, bring them back in a couple weeks, and make sure we're ready for a procedure now. So this is my protocol, and it's worked very well over the, over the course of time. So just a reminder, we're winding down now. We've got just a couple more minutes. Why do we do it? because you can have the best plan in the world, but the patients want to be a part of it. They want to know why. And if you don't communicate that well with them, then your plan will, will likely fail a lot of times. But when you do successfully communicate it, um, the, the success is inevitable. It will get you the compliance. The compliance will get you the outcomes. The outcomes will lead to the referrals, the growth, and the revenue. And in my practice, I've found that I got to have pictures to do it. You've got to have some sort of picture. So if you have no camera, at least go on Amazon or wherever you've got to go to buy an iPhone holder so that you can take a picture at your slit lamp on Monday. Um, but don't stay there long. Graduate, go to the next step where you can really make an impact. You can tell them the story. You can get their buy-in and... Um, have a patient for life and not just one, but they're going to go out and tell patient after patient after patient. So just to recap, the rules to live by, screen everyone, schedule them back for a dry eye valve, do not combine it with your routine exam, make a plan, not just for that exam, but for your office so that your, your staff and you have the confidence you need. Look at this patient when they show up. Look at their lifestyle, their emotional baggage, you know, their environment. What else are they dealing with? And listen to them on that part so that you can create an effective communication system with them and, and relate to them. Show them your findings. Show them their story. And then tell them their options so that you can decide together. This is a wonderful um, just formula for success. And like I said, for lifetime loyalty from these patients. And what is amazing about dry eye is you have to ask yourself this question. Do you want to make three times more or do you want to work a third as hard? So if you imagine this play out with just nine dry eye patients a day, three days per week, um, and let's say that the new patients were six visits a year because we're, we're doing procedures on them, established patients only a couple visits per year. What's neat about this is you see that intersection is the the break-even point, but you're able to generate high revenue without incurring higher cost of operation. And that is pretty amazing because if you think about this and consider cost of goods, cost of operation in a regular routine practice, um, they're going to go up in a parallel fashion. National average $274 on annual revenue per patient. In this scenario, it was twice that, basically $500. Um, or sorry, that was revenue per visit. The annual average average revenue per patient was eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, so say that again: eighteen hundred dollars on revenue per patient, about five hundred dollars revenue per visit on these. And it's because that cost of operation is um, much less that you can truly just absolutely transform your practice and not be afraid. Uh, when I did mine, uh, when I made my big shift, I wrote down basically what's the worst that could happen, but I never dreamed uh, about what's the best that could happen. And it's definitely exciting. It's exciting just when you carve out a, a portion of your practice to do this. And I think it will surpass your expectations every single time. If you want more information, you can go to dryeye.institute and click on contact us. That will uh, send a contact straight to me if you want to reach out to me. Um, but if you want more information about uh, that course and retreat in particular, you can go there and find it. I wish you all the best. Thanks for listening.